really excited to hear from you. Um, so Dr. Stoddard is an assistant professor in the School of Nursing with a joint appointment in the Department of Health Behavior and Health Education in the School of the, uh, excuse me, the School of Public Health. Her research interests include understanding the interaction between individual factors and social and environmental factors, such as poverty, relationships, um, neighborhood characteristics, and how together they shape the um, psychosocial development and health trajectories of at-risk urban youth and the application of behavioral and ecological approaches to prevent risk behaviors in youth. Dr. Stoddard um, completed her MS and PhD at the University of Minnesota and um, completed a postdoctoral fellowship in health promotion, health um, and risk reduction interventions with vulnerable populations in the School of Nursing at the University of Michigan. Her career was focused on promoting um, the health and well being of youth living in communities characterized by substantial health and social disparities and includes professional experience as a local public health nurse um, focused on maternal child health, such as you just shared, um, a nurse practitioner in um, community and school based clinics, and the state of adolescent um, health coordinator for the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, and I have to ask you one question real quickly as a big basketball fan, um, who do you cheer for, Michigan or Minnesota? Michigan. It's hard not to cheer for Michigan when you're here. And in fact, I've never watched so many sports in general since I moved here. So right. that's good. Then you were you were allowed to continue speaking. And, and I just want to add a quick update. Maybe this wasn't an update in her bio, but Sarah is a tenured associate professor as of this fall. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here and to share some of my work. I will share my screen. Okay, so um, today I thought I would uh, share some of the work that I've been doing um, looking at substance misuse among school disengaged youth. Um, and I'm going to share kind of, I'm going to start talking just a little bit about kind of why um, we should look at that population um, and kind of the relationship between school disengagement and substance uh, misuse. And then I think depending on time, I think we should have enough time. I'm going to talk about the in, uh, intervention that I um, kind of adapted, really developed, um, and have been pilot testing. So many of you probably know, um, you know, why we care about alcohol and marijuana use um, and other substance use um, among adolescents. You know, these are data from Monitoring the Future, actually 2019, I didn't update them for the latest, but they really haven't changed um, very much. Um, you know, we know that adolescence is a time of um, kind of experimentation, but, um, but then also, you know, kind of starting behaviors that can turn into um, more problematic use um, in the future. Um, we do know that perceived risk of marijuana use has declined over the last um, few years as marijuana has become um, legalized. Um, and, you know, that those perceptions of its risk and or safety, you know, have really changed and um, kind of changed the nature of what young people think about marijuana in particular now. Um, so, you know, why do we care about uh, school disengaged youth? Um, we know that youth who are school disengaged during middle school are at in, um, increased for continued school disengagement, uh, leaving secondary school prior to graduation um, or dropping out um, and engaging in risky behaviors such as alcohol and drug use. Um, so I see the middle school years as a critical time for um, engaging young people in uh, kind of prevention of um, alcohol and drugs. Um, but yet we didn't know and, and kind of hadn't known a lot about the relationship between school disengagement um, and substance use. And then more in particular, I've been interested in using um, summer school um, and summer as an opportunity for intervention. And we really don't know very much about um, young people who actually currently participate in summer school. So the purpose of kind of the two um, there are two kind of connected studies um, that I'm going to start with was really to examine the relationship between summer school attendance, school disengagement, and substance use. And this is using a national sample of eighth grade students. So it's using monitoring the future. Um, many of us are familiar with that because it is um, kind of housed here out of um, ISR. 
Um, it's a nationally representative samples of secondary school students in the US. Um, it's really the largest um, national study um, that looks at various types of substance use and both indicators of school engagement or disengagement and um, summer school. Um, it began in 1991. Many of you know it's a, it's a series of cross-sectional studies um, that started in 1991. Um, it's done annually. Um, there is also a panel study, so a group that they're following over time, which I'm not going to talk about today. Um, and it's done in 8th, 10th, and 12th grade in both public and private schools. They um, do, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar, there is a multi-stage sampling process that happens where they do try to get this nationally representative sample, first looking, uh, targeting uh, geographic area, and then selecting schools, and then sampling students within schools. So these are the items that I will use um, for both of the analyses that I talk about. So they had a single item for sub, uh, summer school attendance. Um, and then there are eight items that talk about um, kind of school, either whether, depends how you look at it, disengagement or engagement. Um, and that's ever, um, have you ever been held back, um, ever suspended, misbehaved in school, cut a full day of class um, or skipped, um, uh, poor grades. Um, and then there's two questions that ask about um, whether they think they'll graduate from high school and whether they'll attend college. And then for substance use, um, we used um, past 30 day um, cigarette use, marijuana use, and non medical um, prescription drug um, use, and then past two week binge drinking. Um, some of the demographic characteristics um, that we also included were um, sex, race, um, highest level of parent education as a proxy for um, kind of uh, socioeconomic status, cohort year, um, and then urbanicity, so urban versus rural. So the first um, study or analysis um, that, and I should share, this is with um, Dr. Phil Valise, um, and I have done um, the work on um, these two um, studies together, um, is to examine the association between summer school attendance, school disengagement, and recent substance use in um, using the monitoring the future data. So we use the publicly available de-identified data set um, from monitoring the future of, um, and we looked at the eighth grade students. Um, I was most, you know, eighth grade is really a time um, that I think is important. You know, it's getting to that transition to high school. It's also a time where if you're already seeing um, substance use at that age, you know, it, it can be seen as rather problematic. I mean, we're used to initiation and some of that happening, you know, mid high school, you know, into high school. But if you're already seeing that in eighth grade, um, you know, that that's to me a more problematic behavior. Um, so the eighth grade sample, um, we looked at it from 1997 through 2016 for this um, analysis. Sample is really half female, half white. Um, so we looked at bivariate analysis. We did odds ratios and adjusted odds, odds ratios. Um, all this work was done in STATA. We did use the weights that were appropriate for MTF for the, the way they um, kind of sample. Um, and select participants. So just a, you know, a little bit about the sample. So 17% um, of the eighth graders reported that they had attended summer school. Um, uh, minority youth were more likely to be um, in um, summer school and had, and I'll show a couple graphics, um, had consistently higher rates of summer school attendance over the 20 year period. So here is a graphic that um, looks at trends in male attending, males attending summer school. Um, you can see the top um, line, oops, I'll go over, sorry, I have two screens. Um, you see the top line is um, uh, black males, um, the uh, kind of that middle da dash line are other males, and then down below is white males, and then um, total eighth graders um, is at the bottom. And then um, this is for um, females again. Um, so again, uh, black females, uh, females of other um, kind of minority um, race ethnicities are more likely to attend summer school. And this was 
consistent over time. And you also see that really the rates of summer school participation were pretty consistent over time too. So kind of a big table of busyness, but um, I want you to focus primarily on um, kind of the substance use um, uh, odds ratios um, here um, in the bottom corner. And this is for looking at summer school attendance. So students who attended summer school had higher odds of binge drinking, cigarette use and marijuana use compared to students who had never attended summer school. And you can see that summer school attendance was significantly associated with all the school disengagement indicators. Um, but for the next um, slide, you know, focus on kind of just the substance use variables. So then this is the adjusted odds ratios. So when we controlled for indicators of school disengagement, um, the summer school attendance in and of itself, um, the significance for the most part goes away or really reduces. So, you know, really what we found was that um, school disengagement and summer school, um, or that, you know, summer school, sorry, school disengagement was really um, more the predictor of um, cigarette, binge drinking, and marijuana use than um, summer school participation was. So just to kind of summarize, like I said, uh, school disengagement and summer use, summer uh, substance use were both associated with school, um, summer school attendance. Um, but summer school attendance in and of itself was not found to be associated with substance use after controlling for the risk factors of school disengagement. Um, and then we did do a little bit of interactions that I didn't show, but what we did find was that uh, disengaged youth who attended summer school were at slightly lower risk for substance use when compared to their disengaged peers who did not attend summer school. So this is kind of starting to point to, like I said, maybe that summer school attendance could be a little bit protective um, for um, young people against substance use. So then the second um, analysis we did is we built off that first one and we really wanted to look, then look at um, summer school attendance as a mediator in the relationship between school disengagement and substance use. So we did this again with eighth graders uh, participating in MTF. We actually did a little broader range. So we looked from 1991 to uh, 2019. So our sample was, you know, over 400,000 um, eighth graders. Again, half female, half white. Um, you can see the bottom is uh, the cohort breakdown. So you can see that um, the sample was really pretty evenly distributed across the, the cohorts um, in time. So this is, so we did a SEM, uh, structural equation model. Um, and you know, this is the, the model that we um, kind of proposed. So you can see school disengagement was made up of these indicators, the same indicators we used in the previous study. Um, we did a latent um, variable also of substance use. And then um, school, um, summer school attendance was that single item. So again, like I said, we did uh, structural equation modeling. We used full information uh, maximum likelihood estimations to handle the missing data um, across items. We did also account for the complex sampling design and use the weights that were appropriate for um, MTF. Um, we um, looked at um, goodness of fit indicators, um, kind of as mentioned below, the TLI, CFI, uh, the uh, REMSI and uh, chi-square um, test of model fit. So this is, wow, it changed really interestingly on my other screen. So you guys are seeing a good screen. <laughs> my presenter screen just blew up. Um, so here is the um, kind of model with the estimates. So you can see, whoops, sorry, that um, th there was a significant uh, relationship um, and between school disengagement or significant direct effect between school disengagement and substance use. And there was a significant indirect effect um, through school attendance and um, school attendance, uh, summer school attendance did decrease this um, by 5% or accounted for 5% of the direct effect um, 
of school disengagement to substance use. Hopefully I said that clearly enough. So there was, so we um, said that there's a partial uh, mediation um, in our model. So the, um, so what we found kind of implications for really kind of both of these studies um, was that youth um, with a high propensity to use substances do attend summer school. However, uh, attending these programs may reduce the risk of um, substance use. Um, and that maybe this is an opportunity that summer school, is, well, one that targeting students who um, do have school disengagement um, indicators um, you know, is important for the prevention of substance use, that they are at higher risk, and that sub, uh, summer school may be a key opportunity um, to provide um, prevention and intervention programming to a high-risk um, group of youth. Um, what I would say is, so, you know, the summer school that they were, we don't know in these studies what summer school looked like for them. Um, most likely it was academic summer school, um, you know, or that at least many of them were um, participating in potentially some sort of required academic summer school. Um, and so honestly, to see kind of some benefits of summer school kind of as this idea of a protective factor is really positive when you're not, you probably weren't doing anything there related to kind of substance use prevention um, at all um, at that point. Okay, so um, now I want to spend a little bit of time. We're we doing on time. Okay, we're good on time. So I now wanted to share. I thought I would share some. Um, I think the group probably has some interest in, you know, kind of big data and you know, kind of larger data. So I wanted to share some of the work I had done with MTF to kind of entice that part of the group, and then others I'm hoping might be interested in some of the kind of intervention development adaptation and kind of pilot studying of an intervention. And so hopefully this will um, be of interest then to you. Um, so Youth Empowerment Solutions for Positive Futures is um, a summer program, summer enrichment program that um, I developed about four years ago now during uh, my K01 um, that I had funded through NIDA. Um, it is an adaptation of Mark Zimmerman's um, after school program, Youth Empowerment uh, Solutions. Um, Youth Empowerment Solutions, the after school program and Mark's program had really been uh, focused on community and preventing violence. Um, I, um, but, you know, grounded in empowerment theory. Um, so I took and delivered an after school. So I took that program and thought, could we deliver it during the summer? I kind of hypothesized that, um, you know, kind of empowerment would be good for um, kind of the development of kind of future orientation, um, expectations about the future, and that both of these together would be helpful for young people who are um, school disengaged and um, kind of to prevent substance use. Um, I designed it specifically for young people who had um, school disengagement indicators. Um, and, um, you know, so the summer program, the way I developed it was really, you know, kind of specific um, for that population. So the goal of um, Youth Empowerment Solutions for Positive Futures um, is to enhance empowerment, leadership skills, future orientation, and to create a positive connection to school as mechanisms for um, the reduction of um, dropout and um, alcohol and drug use um, kind of perceptions and um, behaviors. So I didn't talk at all about future orientation. My, the other, another aspect of my work has really been looking at future orientation um, and how young people um, kind of think about and feel about their future. Um, we know that it is a multi-dimensional construct that um, captures kind of someone's motivation, their cognition and their actual behaviors. And we know that um, through research other people have done and that I've done is that it is important for both academic and non-academic um, kind of domains. So I have found uh, future orientation to be um, uh, associated with um, violence, bullying, um, attitudes um, about violence, and then around um, substance use indicators, um, kind of intentions, norms, 
um, actual behaviors, substance use behaviors. So um, I have found kind of this future orientation to be important in that a higher um, kind of future orientation or higher future expectations, less violence, less substance use, uh, less intentions to use um, alcohol and drugs, those kinds of things. Ah, and here's a slide that says that. Um, so like I mentioned, I've looked at both um, this in kind of middle to later um, adolescence, emerging adulthood, um, and have looked at um, some of this um, over time as well. Um, so this is the conceptual model for um, the, the intervention. So the idea is that the program and contents of the program would, um, and I'm missing an arrow, would um, enhance both psychological empowerment and future orientation. Um, but that some of this, um, some of the program would be kind of indirectly affect kind of these outcomes through for future orientation, you know, from psychological um, empowerment, but then there would also be kind of direct effects um, of the program through um, kind of future orientation to um, the, um, the outcomes. So both pro-social behavior, school outcomes and substance use outcomes. So like I mentioned, um, I did um, keep the core components of um, Mark's um, intervention, um, the after school program. I did um, target it more though and think about it more for sixth and seventh graders. Um, I increased the amount of kind of activities that were focused on thinking about the future, um, kind of goal setting, um, moving around obstacles, um, those kinds of activities. Um, I, uh, and then of course my, um, my outcomes of interest were school um, disengagement, um, school dropout and substance misuse. The program, so I set it up to be, uh, um, most schools now have run it for five weeks. Four weeks was too short. The first year we did run it in one school for four weeks more because of their time um, uh, kind of commitment um, for summer school. Um, but most programs, uh, most of the time um, when I've worked with schools, we've run it now for five weeks. I think it should be six weeks, ideally, but so five to six week program. Um, it is delivered by trained facilitators. Um, it's the program's manualized. So I have um, created, you know, their um, clear kind of uh, instructions, descriptions of activities. Um, and then um, I train uh, teachers in one school has used social workers and paraprofessionals as well mm -hmm. as the leaders um, of the groups. It is really meant to be um, youth driven adult supported. Um, so there is training for the facilitators around kind of that concept um, and that they are really um, kind of you know, trying to um, really provide support for the students and some leadership, but it's really the students, especially when they get to the project aspect of the, um, the program that the students are, you know, kind of taking this active kind of leadership role in what they're doing. Um, so this, you know, really the goals are here. Um, and I've kind of already touched on that. You know, pieces of it is to um, form positive relationships with adults in their school. Um, you know, I think about it as trying to give them some positive connections to school that maybe some, you know, young people who are disconnected don't have. So the curriculum is, um, I said, as I mentioned, it's manualized. There's five units. Um, youth as leaders, learning about your school community. So in the youth as leaders, they really learn about, um, they look at different leaders, kind of think about leadership skills, what makes a good leader. We talk about youth leaders. Um, and so there are activities where we look and they, you know, and, and try to envision themselves in, um, you know, some of the youth leaders that we talk about. Learning about your school community. So a big part of this is they do a school assessment. They look at kind of risks in their school um, and maybe kind of positive and, or assets of their school community. Um, and then what they do is um, they create 
they kind of, so they're going to create a, um, a project, a school improvement project. So through their assessments, they kind of try to identify things that they want to maybe change about their school community. And um, they develop a proposal. Um, they develop a presentation that they deliver to school leadership um, for approval, and then they complete the project. And that's part of four, uh, unit four. But through then unit three, they talk about um, building partnerships. And some of that planning for change is that planning of the, the project that they're going to work on. So they have a small budget, they have to do the budget, they have to look up prices for things, you know, so and again, the adult is there to kind of help guide them. But the students are really there to do, you know, kind of come up with the, the project. Um, you know, every student, I feel like every student and every school I've ever been in, they want to change the bathrooms or fix the bathrooms. And, you know, so you need the leader to talk, you know, say, well, you know, we don't really, that's not really feasible. That's not really, um, you know, you don't have the money to fix bathrooms. So, um, you know, it, it's helping guide them in a way to a project that is feasible. Um, and then the core components that uh, we work on our self-esteem, leadership efficacy, personal passions and strengths, goal setting, school engagement, self-representation. So how do I uh, represent myself? Uh, leadership, um, and my screen's cut off on the bottom. But, so here are, so as I so the activities are all interactive. So we tried to make it not like sitting down in school. We tried to make it more interactive, more fun for students. Um, what you're seeing are just a couple pictures of activities that they do. Um, they do an activity where they think about who they think of as leaders. Um, and like I said, characteristics of leaders. Um, the, I don't know if you've ever built the towers before. That's really a team building kind of exercise and kind of working together. How do you work together as a team? And like I said, you know, so they do these youth driven school improvement projects. These are some images of projects that um, different schools have done. Um, so the, the one school, these pictures here, um, this school had um, benches um, donated several years before this. They're outside. They, of course, had weathered, you know, they really looked in disrepair. So the students um, proposed to, you know, they sanded them, repainted them. They wanted to put uh, paint motivational um, statements um, on the back of them. So they did about 10 of the benches. These are actually more of the benches here. So the following year, um, a, another group of students took this set of benches and again cleaned them up and then painted them the rainbow colors. You know, we've had students do kind of um, fixing up the, the gardens around the school. Um, we've had students do, it doesn't have to be a physical project. I had one group of students that wanted, they did a bake sale and a car wash. They partnered with a fire department that was next door and was able to use their hoses and things. And they wanted to raise more money for um, student awards in their school. Um, so they did that. So they've been a variety of different projects. So I mentioned I have pilot tested um, the intervention. Um, so I have data from baseline and post-intervention at three months and six months. Um, I'll share today the six-month post-intervention data. Um, students receive a small financial incentive for, for participating in the um, survey. So it's like $10 for the first survey, $15 for the second, um, 15, third, 24th. Um, so they kind of incrementally go up over time. Um, the inclusion criteria um, as I mentioned, it's school disengagement. So I work with schools to identify young people who fit some of these you know, characteristics. They don't have to have all of them, but uh, frequent absenteeism, so truancy or chronic absenteeism, um, behavioral issues in school, uh, poor academic performance, um, and schools do already track this. Um, there's the early warning system um, that many schools, it's the state system and most schools um, across the state use it to, and they're supposed to be monitoring these kids anyway and helping connect them to intervention. Um, so I already mentioned that. Um, I did obtain both parent and youth abs uh, 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 assent um, to participate and then the program does run four hours a day, four days a week. And for this study, it was five weeks. Um, and then, like I said, uh, it's delivered by trained facilitators. They're typically in groups of um, eight to 10 students per facilitator. 
So I was in two school districts, two middle schools, um, 67 students enrolled, uh, 55 students completed the baseline um, interview. So what I found is um, I need to over enroll because um, they, um, there's a, a fair number that won't arrive the first day. And, you know, I think that's one, I think we have to remember, and, and I, I have to always, I've been trying to get funding for NIDA to do a big scale of this, but I have to kind of constantly be putting in there that these are high risk kids and families, and, you know, they have issues with chronic absenteeism. And, you know, so to even to get them there is, you know, it's a challenging population to get there. I would say that, so then 55 students completed baseline, um, about half um, were male. Um, and then um, for this uh, study, I did include sixth, seventh, and um, or so post six, post seventh, and post, post eighth graders. And, and then a little over half the um, sample is black. Um, so what I got for post test though was, so out of 55 students, 51, per, uh, 51 completed post test and 52 uh, uh, post test one, 52 completed the second post test. Um, and actually 53 completed the full intervention with only missing, you know, and I think I have, um, so there was only two that completely dropped out um, of the, the, that didn't complete, um, you know, a significant amount of it. About, I, I don't know if I have a slide later, about 50% of the students came every day so I think that is really important to know that these are, you know, disengaged students, high risk families, and 50% came every day. Um, the other 38% only missed one or two days. So really attendance was really good for what ends up being a 24 session program. I'm not gonna read through all of these. Of course, I measure a ton of stuff, um, just like everybody does. Um, and so it, if you think about the conceptual model, these are all aspects of the conceptual model um, that I assess. And, I've, and I'm happy to share any of these. They are, um, for the most part, all um, available, you know, measures that have been used in other studies um, previously. So I did um, descriptive statistics, paired t-test and Cohen's D. So here is the six months post-test um, kind of results. And I have not uh, um, reverse coded a couple of these. So these are all in the direction that we want them to be, even if it looks like it reduced instead of got better, it's the wording and I need to go back in and, and get these flipped. But so these were the, um, I'm only showing you the things that were significant or kind of border significant um, where we saw some small effects. So um, at six months post-intervention, we saw um, uh, significant um, changes in leadership efficacy, future expectancies, um, school attitude, emotional engagement um, in school, um, uh, AOD expectancies. So that's um, their feeling about um, no. whether they would um, use in the future or use in the next, uh, in the coming year, and then pro social behaviors. And you can see that, you know, couple, like a couple of these were border or not quite significant, but their Cohen's D still indicated, you know, kind of a small effect size. Um, and some of that, this is related to sample, I think, too. make sure I don't miss a question. So, I mean, this was with 55 um, or really 52 students. Um, so I thought this was pretty promising um, for kind of a pilot study. As I mentioned, there's several things to kind of consider and limitations of this. I also did not have a control group. So this was only students in the intervention condition. Um, it was, you know, sample size was relatively small, um, but I, thought that, and this is one of two, I have a, a previous um, kind of smaller set of analyses that also kind of indicated that um, the intervention was um, kind of promoting um, kind of these characteristics and um, kind of things that I, I think then will also be important for um, substance use. There was very little substance use in the groups, which was interesting too. Um, now, you know, they're young, um, there were a few students that did um, report use, 
Um, but so it's difficult also in this age group to, without a large sample, to really see changes in actual use. So, um, you know, more and more I'm relying on some of those um, kind of early predictors of use, which are some of those kind of attitudes, perceptions, um, kind of those um, types of items. But then also looking at increases in, you know, things like pro-social behaviors, um, connections to school, some of those other outcomes that we, we want to see that will be helpful as well. So I need to acknowledge um, my Career Development Award um, and pilot funding that I received through the Office of Research. And I always appreciate the students and school personnel who participate and continue to be excited um, about the program. Um, one of the schools I work with in particular has um, always adds extra teachers um, and wants to, uh, through their own funds, um, to have more students participate in the program. So they've been a great supporter of um, kind of the work and, and the program. And there's just a couple citations um, for the two studies in particular um, that have been published here. I'm happy to provide additional references um, for other, other things here as well. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'll watch the chat for any questions um, people have. One question I had, well, actually first um, for my own clarification, at what age, I know that marijuana is now legal in Michigan, mm -hmm. what age can they start legally getting it? I want it, is it 21? I, I think it's 21. I don't think it's 18 even. I think it's 21 here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Lisa's agreeing with me. Okay. I had no idea. Yeah, it's 21 <laughs> like alcohol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, and then did it surprise you that like in your first study that you mentioned mm -hmm. that 17% um, of eighth graders attend cyber school? Did that seem high or low to you? It was higher than I expected, but it's not my area. No, I would say that's pretty consistent. Um, with what, you know, kind of other, you know, other schools and other places report. Um, now, where it gets a little bit funny is kind of how you define summer school versus summer camps and summer programming. You know, so, you know, I think there are kids, you know, so if it's academic summer school versus summer school that um, is just trying to you know, engage kids in other activities or to have something for, you know, young people to do um, during um, kind of the summer. So, you know, we couldn't tell from this. Well, this one was not specific in um, kind of that it was outside programs. We're assuming that most of the kids in this were attending academic summer school. And this was ever completed, ever been in summer school. So it may not have been exactly that past year but it could have been in one of the previous years. So I'd say that we weren't surprised by that, um, I guess, yeah. Thanks, Sarah, for a great talk. It was just so interesting. And so it's so far afield from the work that I do. Um, and, but I have so many questions. I'm gonna start with the, the concept of future expectations. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious um, kind of how you measure that, um, mm -hmm. if it tends to change over time and kind of what, um, you know, if there are other, you know, either child or, or adolescent or family characteristics that are typically associated mm -hmm. with that measure. Yeah, so um, in many studies that I've, many analyses, I should clarify that, many analyses that I've done, the future kind of expectation, future orientation measures have not been very good. Um, historically, it has been measured by many, by several people, especially in areas that probably are more um, kind of, uh, I don't want to say health, but substance use and some of those, it, it's been asked things like, um, you know, it's the common question, do you think you're going to live until 25? Or, you know, it, it, they're rather negative in, in many ways. Um, do you think you're going to complete high school? Do you think you're going to go to college? Um, you know, so some people have measured it that way. I, I pushed back on a lot of people for a while as a reviewer to really say what they're measuring. So I would argue that if you're asking about school, you should be asking about future educational expectations or, you know, if you're not. So I, I've been trying to propose doing a more... Um, 
kind of uh, like I showed um, where you're trying to capture aspects of motivation, cognition and behavior. So trying to make it more kind of multi um, uh, uh, conceptual or, you know, kind of a bigger concept of future expectations mm -hmm. or future orientation how there's a measure it's by Wyman that I've used more. Um, it's also the one that tends to have worked the best. Um, I can go back to the measure table. Here. Actually, I didn't even put it in in this one. Um, so there's one I, I typically use a lot, which is, is Wyman's, but these are, so two, future time perspective is one. So that is really looking at your, whether you're looking, so there's also a present time perspective is the other half of mm -hmm. that scale. And so that's looking at, do you think more about the here and now versus do you think about kind of the future um, and, you know, kind of that aspect of it. Um, I do have questions in there about perceived control over the future, mm -hmm. um, but it is trying to get at, I'm I can't think of the items in the Wyman scale offhand, um, but it is trying to get a little bit more at that, um, uh, not so specific about like, I'm going to use drugs in the future or, you know, or mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that, but more, uh, more conceptual, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I'm happy to share um, those items. That's um, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then my, my other question was, and I know this is not we what you were focusing specifically, but, you know, are there um, either adolescent or family characteristics that are often associated with future orientation? Yeah. And you asked about change over time. So another yeah. colleague and I just did a paper. He has some data and we're each kind of doing one. He really uh, did the piece of trying to look at future um, and that was Wyman's measure of expectations, uh, future expectations um, over time, but it was a short, it was only like a, not even hardly a two year period. We did see some small changes in time, but it was a very short period and it wasn't large changes. We don't know a lot. I would say we don't know a lot about how it does change. There's some different, you know, depending how you look at it, we do see changes in like hope and hopelessness um, that they decrease or that actually there's increases in hopelessness for some young people as they age. Um, so I've done some work in that kind of aspect of thinking kind of about the future. Um, I do know that um, parent uh, kind of uh, um, like parent connection, mother caring, parent caring um, is supportive. Um, their school uh, level factors that are support, a supportive school environment is supportive for um, kind of future orientation and future expectations. Um, trying to think what else. So I, we've done, I've done a little bit around looking at some predictors of kind of different aspects of it, but we don't know, like I said, as much about it, it changing over time. There's still questions about that. Um, there's questions right, about so at what, there's really questions about at what point yeah. in time, just even from, you know, kind of just developmentally, can you really mm -hmm. think about the few, you know, they're mm -hmm. in, you know, and that's why I think sometimes right. we see um, like I said, the changes in hopelessness in certain populations um, that we did was also maybe changes in cognitive kind of development um, mm -hmm. at the same, we questioned that. That was my dissertation work actually, where I looked at hopelessness um, across from early adolescence through late adolescence. And we did see um, uh, increases in hopelessness with age. Um, we also saw, um, I did a uh, multi-group, um, uh, um, mixed um, kind of, uh, sorry, um, this is where the illness is kicking in. Um, I did multi-group, <laughs> uh, multi um, but anyway, the high, the, the group with the highest levels of hopelessness um, had the highest levels of violence with a weapon, actually. So we also know mm. that um, that was some of the violence work that I've done, um, was looking at hopelessness, um, kind of a different way to think about um, kind of future too, so. I don't know Great, if I thanks. answered your that, question very No, well, you did. So That's really you. interesting. And I'll, I'll follow up with the offline because I'd love to talk about yeah. this more because where we see this in um, you know, the, the work that we do around measuring um, values of health states using time trade-off or standard gamble methodology to estimate quality-adjusted life years, um, you know, there's a big push 
to me to elicit measurements directly from adolescents and from children. Um, but not surprisingly, we find adolescent measures are very different from adult measures. Um, and we know that at least some of that is due in part, you know, to um, you know, their belief system that, you know, many of them just don't believe they're ever going to die when they're adolescents. And so, you know, thinking about how to try to disentangle that. And there's been very little work there, but something that I'm hoping to move forward in the next couple of years. So I'll touch yeah. this with you offline. So kind of tangential, but related to kind of the yeah. world too. Thanks. And, you know, and I really think um, environment plays a big role in that. And so I, I do think kind of parents' expectations, um, either for themselves or for their kids matter. I also think the context in which you live, more the neighborhood context and, and some of those characteristics matter. That was some of the work, um, uh, my dissertation work around hopelessness. Um, we That was in 13 of the poorest neighborhoods in the country. And, um, you know, it was interesting doing work there because a lot of those kind of kids and even adults had never left the county or you know so then there's another kind of um kind of aspect of you know if you haven't seen something different how do you think about yourself and your current situation so anyway i i am very interested in like i said how kind of some of those contextual kind of things play into kind of how um, young people perceive themselves and their opportunities or their future um so yeah. Are you planning or able to um, follow any of these um, students longer term? So I was going to try. Or <laughs> so I um, challenging. <laughs> I had one more time point planned, um, and COVID happened, and then we've never gone back. Uh, you know, so that was actually last spring. Um, or kind of last, um, like March, I was supposed to go in um, and do one more. Um, you know, they still really haven't, you know, and, and honestly, I, I don't know that I'll be able to get another time, you know, with them um, realistically either. Um, that will be meaningful too. Or, you know, now it's just, um, it's been so long um, and with everything going on. Um, what I am hearing from schools, though, is um, so I was getting letters again for a proposal and one of them, I have a new school joining um, this time. And so I was talking to them and they were asking about the criteria for the students. And she kind of said, you know, she goes, we're not going to have any problem recruiting or, you know, identifying enough kids. She goes, you know, that they're seeing like school disengagement just increasing or, you know, that more kids are falling behind, you know, more issues with um, kind of grades and testing and, and, you know, and all of those things. So I know um, many communities, at least in schools are and families are, are struggling um, with um, kind of students right now and, and, and school. So Um, and do you have any idea <clears throat> if they weren't in your like five week program, what would they be doing for the summer? Well, so the the two schools that um, I work with mo have worked with most closely over those three years, this was pretty much what they offered in the end. They really used this as their summer programming now and and so much now, of the like remedial, like um, academic work is done online. So what I did see in one of the schools when I would visit, would I'd see kids sitting in the computer lab and, and, and these were probably, these were definitely middle school or older, but doing, I think what was probably remedial coursework or, you know, and um, for kind of their makeup kind of summer coursework. Um, but as far as any other like programming, um, this was what the two schools that I worked with pretty much offered. Um, and that has been the challenge too, is that a lot of, some schools elect to use some of their, I think it's Title I money for summer school for you know students who are at kind of higher risk. Um, but it's been, a lot of summer programs have been cut or they've gone more, they're more, um, I don't wanna say private, but delivered not by school, but by other um, organizations. Um, so I would say, you know, both of these schools, um, most of these kids also qualified for free and reduced price lunch. So um, they did get lunch every day. Um, they, one school got like a, more of a hot breakfast. The other school got bre breakfast snacks. 
Um, so they were provided with meals, which I do think was also an incentive to participate. Um, but we, and they hear too that parents, many parents want their kids to have something to do. Um, and, um, and I heard that from students too, you know, when I would spend time there, you know, one, you know, told me it was, it, she liked coming to school because it was cool there, you know, they had the air on for the most part, you know, and, you know, at home it was so hot and she didn't have anything to do. And so she liked to come to have something different to do. And so I, I do think, um, you know, parents are looking for something schools. I think many would like to offer something. And then I think it sometimes it ends up being a financial constraint or it's what age group is most important important to deliver to. And um, I don't know that I think probably younger students are thought of more than probably middle school and high school age students that that's my own opinion. So I don't know that that's true. But, um, you know, these are kids that can start kind of staying home alone, you know, not ideally, but in many families, they do start staying home alone. which also plays into risk and which is also why summer is a good time to engage them in something positive. So what are your hopes for next steps? Well, so like <laughs> I mentioned, I, this afternoon, I have to finish my R01. No, anyway, um, so I'm <laughs> submitting, um, so I am submitting this again. Um, it's gone to NIDA um, in a couple different versions. Um, I did submit it initially as an R34 um, and then um, was able to get, you know, some funding, you know, for um, kind of pilot work. So then jumped, you know, into more um, submitting for an R01. So it's going in um, kind of for uh, another try for an R01. I've gotten good feedback. It's been well received, I would say. Um, they had um, some questions around just study design that I thought were clear that they didn't. <laughs> anyway, so I've made some changes now to study design a little bit, but they seem excited about the ideas behind it, the the kind of the conceptual model and, and the population. And um, so that they, it's been well received that way. So hopefully, fingers crossed. Yeah, so this is one aspect. Um, Phil and I have a proposal to uh, Phil Valise um, with Monitoring the Future. We have a proposal together at um, the uh, Education, um, the Institute for Educational Studies. Um, so doing some actual longitudinal work, looking at school disengagement with the panel study um, and looking at adult outcomes. Um, and yeah, so those are at least a, a few things. And then I, I also, I'm interested in, um, I've got a, a, some connections to actually what would be the high school version of these young, you know, young people um, that have actually already um, technically mostly drop in, dropped out of school. And um, it's a re-engagement program. And so I have um, some interest in really looking at um, young people who they often refer to as opportunity youth who have um, really disengaged and pretty much dropped out of um, high school um, and ways to, um, one, I'm interested in just understanding them more and, and their kind of needs and um, behaviors, um, but then how to re-engage them in um, educational programs. And um, so I, I'm doing some work there as well. So. And thinking that they're all high risk for substance use, of course, and mental health stuff. So yeah, yeah. this would be, you know, yeah. That's awesome. Well, this was really fascinating. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. It's such um, different work than we do, but so relevant and important and um, excited to hear about. So thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay. So much, Sarah. Okay. I didn't Let's know you were on. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck with the thanks submission. Thanks so much. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Have a busy day. Right. It's mostly thanks. done. <laughs> All right. Take care. Look yep, forward thanks. to talking soon. Bye bye. Yep. Bye. Bye.